This morning we will be studying from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. I want to read those verses with you this morning and then go to the Lord in prayer and ask Him to speak to us powerfully today as we open His Word together. This is a continuation of a long sentence where Paul picks up and says, Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power when He comes in that day to be glorified in His saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Father, we ask today that in Jesus' name you would remind us very clearly, very vividly of the fact that you, Lord God, will repay the unrighteous. Remind us, O oh Father, that you, Lord God, will reward the redeemed. Help us today to see and to sense the urgency of the hour of proclaiming the gospel of truth to a world that has gone off the rails. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. These are tenuous times. The days in which we live are challenging, they're changing, and they're going to become increasingly conflicted for those who try to live the life of righteousness under the leadership of the Holy Spirit and in accordance with the Word of God's truth. The title of the message this morning, It Will Be Worth It All, you might recognize the words in this title as a chorus, part of a chorus from an old song that's entitled, When We See Christ. Now, part of the words, part of the lyrics and the verses of this song speak very clearly to the struggle of our earthly journey. Let me just read a couple of those lyrics for you. This is what the song says. Oft times the day seems long, our trials hard to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur in despair. Another verse says, at times the sky seems dark with not a ray of light. We're tossed and driven on, no human help in sight. And then the chorus comes back to remind us that it will be worth it all when we see Jesus It'll be worth it all when we see Christ. But until then, we live in a world that challenges us. We live in a world where we struggle sometimes. We live in a world where a lot of the journey is uphill. It's tough. And so until then, until we see Christ, we need to live our faith with the understanding that living faithfully may well have significant cost attached at points along the way. It may cost you and I to live our faith. And we need to realize that, and we need to realize that at some points the cost may be extremely significant, and we also need to know that if we choose to live faithfully, that that may be exacted from us at some point, and it may be intensified, it may increase. Paul advised the believers in the early church regarding this very thing. That's what 2 Thessalonians is about. He, he spoke to the early church about the, the difficulty, the challenge, the conflict of living for Christ in a world where in their world it was really quite dangerous to do so. To espouse the Christian faith in their world might well cost them everything. And, and so Paul, in trying to keep the church focused, trying to keep believers focused on what we're here to do, speaks to them and tells them some things about how to, to walk through this world when those challenges arise, how to walk through this world when, when we are conflicted. How do we do that? And so in this passage, he deals with what I would call the treacherous presence 
of opposition to the church. Here he addresses that. And we might even say that it's the treacherous presence of opposition to the gospel of the church that is addressed. And I want you to know, whenever Paul begins to talk about this, he makes much of it. This is not something that he just kind of mentions and then brushes aside. He doesn't say, oh, if you, if you embrace the gospel, if you espouse the truth of God's word, it may be hard from time to time, but, but the, the, the joys and the, the rewards are just going to, they're just going to eclipse all of that and you'll never even notice it. He never says that. And so he begins to talk to the church and he indicates that it is indeed treacherous to live for Christ, to live out the gospel. And we need to realize this. So I want to ask us this morning, first of all, to consider some insights regarding this opposition. And the first thing I want to point out to you from this passage of Scripture is the reality of relentless resistance. Notice what happens in this verse. Paul has already mentioned in verse 5 that you also suffer for the kingdom of God. But then look at what he says in verse 6. It's a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. Then in verse 7, and to give you who are troubled rest. He uses the word trouble. He uses the word suffering. Trouble and suffering, those are not lightweight words. Those are heavy-duty words, heavy-duty indicators of what the church at Thessalonica was going through. And so he's, he's bringing up the reality of the relentless resistance that they face every single day because they choose to live for Christ, because they choose to live in the truth of the gospel. Now, how does this resistance come our way? Well, in this instance, it comes through human instruments. Human instrumentation is the way that trouble comes to the church in Thessalonica. Now, I know that we've read in Ephesians chapter 6, whenever we move into that passage of Scripture that speaks about the, the armor of God, he says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. We wrestle against the, the powers of the darkness. And that's true. We do. Our, our opposition is primarily in, in the other world. It's the unseen world. We wrestle against that, that which is not flesh and blood. But I also want us to realize that there are those who are in the flesh. There are those who are clothed in humanity that have taken up the cause of spiritual wickedness in high places. Amen? There, there are those who openly and willingly espouse the causes of darkness and wickedness, and, and they, they let that become their way of, of pressing against the truth of who God is. And so there are those who have said, yes, I will champion the causes of spiritual wickedness in high places. There are those who pit themselves in opposition against the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and against the gospel that we proclaim. That is a reality, and we need to live in the reality of this relentless existence. How does this come our way? How does this, how does this take root? How does this happen? I, I want to tell you that as this spiritual wickedness is taken up as the cause. It begins to grow as it gains momentum. Let's just think about how this might happen. Let me tell you how it incrementally develops. Uh, someone has a wayward thought. Uh, they, they decide that something about the gospel is not accurate. It's not true. It's not what they want their life to look like. And so they have a wayward thought. And this seems like a, a, good, a good thing for them to pursue. And so they begin to pursue it, and it becomes a behavior. And then they begin to convince others that this behavior is good, that it's better than the gospel, it's better than the way that Christ is established. And, and so as, as they go forward, this begins to, to develop into a mentality. And so people have this mentality that, that God's truth is not, it's not the best, it's not right, it's not accurate, it's not good. And so they begin to, to continue to gain momentum. And the next thing you know, a mindset is in place. 
And so there's this mindset that, that settles into the lives of people where they begin to believe that, that, that the gospel is substandard. It's just not accurate. It's not, really, it's not really applicable to the ways of the world, to the culture that we live in, to the lifestyles that we choose, to the things that we enjoy. And so this mindset occurs. And then from there, it begins to, to grow in momentum until it becomes a movement. And this movement is the antithesis of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the antithesis of the morality and the ethic of Scripture. I'm so scared I'm going to step across this line. <laughs> but they're not. <laughs> They will step across the line, and they'll throw the gospel out. And so this, this mindset now becomes a movement, and as this movement gains strength and power, it then becomes a menace to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you that that's about where we're living. We're facing that reality and, and I'm, not, I'm not a harbinger of bad news to you today, but I'm trying to tell us the truth. That we're walking through a culture right now where everything that you and I believe is being called up front and it's being challenged by those who want something different, those who've embraced something different. And, and you cannot tell me that there is not a movement afoot to, to squelch the voice of those who proclaim the gospel of God's truth. It's the world we're walking in. And it becomes a menace to, to God's truth, to God's church. So it grows as it gains momentum. And I want to tell you something else about it. Its goal is destruction. Let me tell you, the world that has embraced the antithetical movement to the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's not just interested in distracting the church. It's not just interested in disagreeing with what you and I say and believe. It, it's not even just interested in disrupting our processes and disrupting our goals and disrupting our determination to evangelize and to be missiological and sharing and preaching the gospel to the ends of the earth. I want you to understand that the goal of this antithetical movement, this menace to the gospel of Jesus Christ is the destruction of God's truth, God's church, God's gospel, and everything that is of God. To the extent that alternate views will ultimately be imposed upon everybody, even with force, if necessary. That's the world we're walking into. And we better prepare ourselves for it. Paul is talking to a church that understood that world. As he writes these words, he says, I know that it's hard. I know that it's tough. I know that you suffer. I know that there are those who trouble you. There are those who trouble the church. There are those who trouble the gospel of God. He's talking to a church that lived it. And I'm talking to a church that should probably prepare we're walking through dark days, difficult times. And so what do we do? How do we respond to that? Well, here's something that Paul tells the church of his day as they prepare to walk in that, as they, as they live in that reality, and as we prepare to walk in something of that reality. This is what he says to them. He says, what you need to understand is this, that the responsibility for retribution is not yours. Now, I'm going to tell you that that's a hard one because we, we, like to, we like to respond. But look at what he says. Verse number 6. We haven't even left verse number 6 yet. We're going to be here till supper. He says, Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay those who trouble you, to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. It is a righteous thing with God. This is God's purview. This is God's responsibility. So, so the responsibility of retribution is something that is divinely implemented. God retains the responsibility of repaying those who afflict the people of God. He holds that responsibility as his own. And let me, let me, let me make a distinction here. We may resist persecution, but it is God who repays persecution. Why? 
Because God alone is just. <laughs> if, if I begin to think about repaying persecution or affliction or those who trouble me, my viewpoint is going to be slanted. It's not going to be fair. You come at me with one barrel, I'm coming at you with two. Okay? That's just, that's just the way of things. That's the way we are. And, and, so, and so God is the only one who's fair. God is the only one who's just. God knows what needs to happen. God has ordained in eternity how retribution and repayment needs to occur. God alone is just. We have no capacity to dispense any equitable retribution. This is God's purview. But I want you to understand this. God will always balance the accounts. God will always make the books come out just like they should. So, it's divinely implemented, the retribution of God. It's also something that I want you to understand is extreme and disastrous. Now, much of modern-day proclamation wants to step back from this reality and kind of soft-pedal it here. I don't think God saw that whenever He was writing this book. Whenever God gave us the Scripture, he, la he laid it out there bare. And we need to lay it out there bare as well. First thing I want to say about God's retribution, God's repayment for those who would trouble the church, is that it always comes in the aftermath of His mercy that's been rejected. Okay? God doesn't just arbitrarily choose people who are living a, 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 a resistant life and, and, and throw lightning bolts at them. God extends mercy always before He extends judgment. And, and so it comes in the aftermath of rejected mercy. He speaks here about those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of God. So He's speaking about those who've had the opportunity to make a choice to choose to respond in obedience to God's truth, to choose to respond in obedience to God's Word. So those who, who refuse to know God through obedience to the gospel, those who've rejected His mercy, are those who are now in line for retribution. The second thing I would say about it is it comes in vivid display. He speaks here about flaming fire. And vengeance. He, he said they'll be punished with everlasting destruction. He says that this is going to be something that is revealed from heaven in flaming fire, taking vengeance. So it's, it comes in vivid display. It's a powerful, powerful moment in, in, in reality. And the third I want you to understand is that this retribution that comes from God is a deserved and a final judgment. It's not something that is limited or temporal punishment. It's not something that just happens in a moment and it's over. It's not something that just happens in time and it's done. He speaks here about this becoming something that moves into everlasting destruction that includes banishment from the presence of the Lord forever and forever and forever. And this is a continual existence. It is not annihilation. It's not obliteration. It's not that somebody is just poof and they're gone. This is something that is a, a continued reality, a continued experience for all of eternity, for all of eternity, for those who reject the gospel of God and choose not to know Him through His Son, the Lord Jesus. And I want to say one more thing about it. It's not unfair or disproportionate. There are those who talk about the fact that they can't believe a loving God would choose to send somebody away from His presence to everlasting destruction forever and forever. It's not God's choice. God extends mercy. God extends grace. And those who choose to reject God's mercy and reject God's grace, those who choose to reject the love of God, have chosen for themselves an eternity separated from Him forever and forever. It is a choice of the individual who does not obey the gospel of Christ. They decide their eternal outcome. The responsibility of retribution, thank God, is not ours. It rests on His shoulders. He also mentions in here something else that's important for us to recognize. He's spoken to us about the reality of relentless resistance. He's spoken to us about the responsibility of retribution being God's and being divinely implemented. Now He speaks to us also about the reward for the redeemed. Did you know there's a reward for those who have entrusted their lives to God 
by responding to the grace that is extended to us through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. There is a reward. And, and the reward is, is really a twofold reality. First of all, it is the ultimate vindication for the, for the people of God and for the testimony of God's Word. The fact is that, that the testimony, he says, as God brings us into that final reward is something that, that proves the testimony of God's Word to be true. There's an ultimate vindication in that we're rewarded in eternity by our God. And he speaks about that. He says that, that we'll have the opportunity to enter into his presence and to marvel at his presence forever and forever and forever. When that day comes, because it proves the testimony of God to be true. So it's an ultimate vindication, but it's also what he calls a final rest. Uh, I don't know how that word strikes you. He says he'll give to you who are troubled rest with us. Rest is a, an amazing thing, isn't it? Some of you know that really well right now because... You're sacked out now, I'm teasing. You? I know you're all right on the edge of your seats right here with me every step of the way, right? We like rest. We, we enjoy rest. Rest speaks to us about, about the, the absence of labor. It speaks to us about the absence of turmoil or trouble. It speaks to us about a, an opportunity for calmness and repose. And, 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 as, and as he speaks to us about this final rest, there seems to be in this, in this, this passage which is um, uh, it's a, it's a passage that moves us into thoughts about the end of time. And so there seems to be some connection between the intensification of suffering and the coming day of the Lord. And, and that, that seems to be present in this passage. When, when you begin to look at the idea of rest in Scripture, there are several different ideas that, it, that, it, that carry that theme forward. The, the first Thing that we really learn about rest in the Bible is, is what's called Sabbath rest or the creation rest, the rest from creation whenever God did, did all the creative work in six days and then on the seventh day God rested. And then it was written into the law of God in the Ten Commandments. Six days you should do all your labor and on the seventh day you're to rest. So we think about that idea of rest and, and we think about the, 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 what we forget about the other six days. He says, in six days you labor. Well, we're in, we're in those six days as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ right now. We're, we're in that, that point of time where we're here to work. We're here to serve. We're here to proclaim God's truth and God's message. We're here to reach the world with the gospel. And, and that, that's not a restful thing. It's, a, it's active. It's, it requires effort. It requires the extension and investment of ourselves. And so we want to be actively doing that. So you have that Sabbath rest. Then you have the idea of, of what, was, what was termed Canaan rest whenever God brought his people out of the, the, the land of Egypt and brought them through the wilderness and established them in the land and gave them, Scripture says, rest from all of their enemies round about. So you have the idea of Canaan rest, the Canaan rest that the people of God enjoyed whenever he brought them into that time of prosperity and, 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 and growth and productivity. And then whenever you move into the New Testament, you have the idea of what we might call salvation rest, where God comes to us in His grace and gives us the opportunity to have our sin overcome by His goodness and by His mercy and by His forgiveness, and so, so that the burden of our sin is lifted from us. And, and we read the verses on the video, Come unto me, all ye who weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And Jesus gives us rest from dragging that burden of sin along with us in this life. He lifts that burden and frees us from that. But then we also have the idea of eternal rest or heaven rest. Whenever one day all of this work will be over, all this toil, all this labor, all this dragging of all the weight of conflict and, and struggle and persecution and challenge and responsibility, all that will be over in, this, in the sense of, of what we're here to do. And we'll enter into that place that God has prepared for all of those who love Him, all of those who've served Him, all of those who's, who've given their lives away to, to receive the life that he has. So, so you have this, this final rest, and, and it's really an eschatological rest that he's talking about here. Eschatology being the, the, the technical word, the, the, the phrase that speaks about things related to the end of time. So this is, this is that rest that is yet to come. In, in the day, in the coming day, when the Lord, it says, shall appear in all of his glory with his angels and his mighty power. And bring us unto himself, and there we'll spend forever with him in that eternal rest that he's prepared. 
In fact, Scripture says about those who die in the Lord, blessed are those who die in the Lord, for they have ceased from their labors and they've entered into the eternal rest of God. So, Paul speaks to us here about the fact that it'll be worth it all. (laughs) It'll be worth it all. Here we struggle. Here we face an uphill battle. Here we we move forward in courage. We move forward with the, 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 the hand of God carrying us and strengthening us and encouraging us. But one day, one day, we'll enter into that forever that He's prepared for us and it will be worth it all. I want to leave you this morning with just a few truths to consider. I'm going to give you six truths, and you may want to just jot these down. They're, they're, they come right out of this passage, but they're things to kind of take home and, 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 and live, live with as reminders that God's Word teaches us about the, the troubling that we experience in this life. First thing is this. Unjust suffering does occur. We live in a world that is predominantly hostile to God and the things of God and the truth of who God is. Unjust suffering does occur. So don't be surprised when it does. When it happens, don't be shocked by that. God told us it would. And so prepare yourself for it. Secondly, unjust suffering will be repaid. Unjust suffering will be repaid. So you really don't even have to concern yourself about that part of unjust suffering. Leave that to God. Unburden yourself from believing that you need to to repay persecution and let God handle it. He says, vengeance is mine. I'll repay. Third, mercy is available to everyone, even to the persecutors. God doesn't want anyone to perish, but he wants everyone to come to repentance. And so we need to understand that, that, that the retribution of God extended toward those who reject His gospel is a final resort. It's the, it's the last option that God has. He extends grace. He extends hope and help to everyone who will receive that. God is able to save even to the uttermost those who come to Him through His Son, the Lord Jesus. So mercy is God's first Option, God's first choice, God's first offering, even to the persecutors. Fourth thing is this. The existence of mercy doesn't nullify justice. The fact that God is a merciful God doesn't mean that He must not act in justice whenever His mercy is rejected. God is just as much as He's merciful. And His justice must unfold if mercy is rejected. So the existence of mercy doesn't nullify justice. It will either be justice or it will be mercy, but it can't be both. The fifth thing, <clears throat> the promise of retribution doesn't eliminate the pain of suffering. Whenever we suffer for the gospel, it hurts just as much, even though we know that God is going to take care of it. The pain is still present, and it will be. In this life, you will hurt. In this life, you will struggle. In this life, you will suffer. Especially if you take up the gospel cause. Finally, both retribution and relief will be eternal. For those that God extends retribution, that retribution will last for all of eternity. And so we pray and we ask God, to to reach into the lives of people who have resisted His gospel and and to open their hearts and their minds to the reality of of who Christ is and what Christ has done and the fact that Jesus wants to bring to them salvation and forgiveness of sin and open the door of heaven to them when this life is over. Relief will also be eternal. The rest that we enter into, it'll be that place where there is no more sorrow, there's no more suffering, there's no more sin, there's no more pain, there's no more death, there's no more crying, no more tears. All these things will have passed away. Can you imagine what it will be like to have the wonder of that experience forever and forever and forever in His presence? See, the song that I read to you earlier, oft times the day seems long, our trial's hard to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur in despair. 
But hear the next line. But Christ will soon appear to catch his bride away. All tears forever over in God's eternal day. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. That second verse, at times the sky seems dark with not a ray of light. We're tossed and driven on, no human help in sight. But there's one in heaven who knows our deepest care. Let Jesus solve your problems. Just go to him in prayer. Life's day will soon be o'er, all storms forever past. We'll cross the great divide to glory, safe at last. We'll share the joys of heaven, a harp, a home, a crown. The tempter will be banished. We'll lay our burdens down. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. It will be worth it all when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrows will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. Would you bow your heads with me, please? If you're here this morning and Jesus, Jesus Christ has not become Lord, Savior, Master of your life, I want you to know that He died. He died for you so that your sin could be overcome by His grace and His mercy. And today, if you will place your trust in Him, if you will say to Him, Oh, Lord Jesus, I want that gift to be true in my life. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your mercy. I receive your grace. I believe your gospel message is true. I believe you died for me. And I receive you today. If you'll pray a prayer like that, if you'll open your heart to Jesus today, I want you to know that when this journey's over for you, heaven will be your home. Rest will be your reward. Say yes to Jesus today. Say yes to him. Don't resist his gospel any longer. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for coming to this earth for carrying burdens heavier than we'll ever carry, for suffering more intensely than we'll ever suffer, for being persecuted beyond anything that we could ever even imagine for us. Thank you for that. Thank you that by your grace, you extend to us the opportunity for God's justice to be satisfied in the death of Jesus on the cross and for God's mercy to cover us as we come to you in faith. Father, if there's anybody here today that needs to say yes to Jesus, please, please prompt them in their heart to cry out to you right now. If that's your reality this morning, I want you to know that we would love to help you with a decision like that. And if you need to speak to somebody, we're happy to to make ourselves available to do that. So if you're here this morning, over the next couple of minutes, we're going to have some music playing and quietness. And you, you can feel free to just slip out of your seat and walk to the, the door where the main foyer is. And there'll be somebody there that'll be happy to visit with you about anything that's going on in your life spiritually, whether it's your need to trust Christ, your need to renew your commitment to him, questions about uniting with this church, anything at all, we're happy to speak with you. So as the music begins to play, let God move in your heart.